Okay, well, um, hello everybody. Welcome to today's Philosophy of Physics seminar. And it's, um, it's a pleasure to introduce Valeria Chisova from the University of Salzburg, where she's uh, currently a postdoc. Uh, before that, she did her PhD um, at uh, the University of Louvain and um, on topics related to what she's talking to us about today. In 2018, she was a, a prize winner in the Young Researchers uh, competition of the Société de Philosophie des Sciences. Um, so Valeria, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Oliver, uh, for organizing this. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, yeah, I'm currently in Salzburg. Uh, I was in uh, Um I was studying direct empirical status there. And in between, I was uh, in the French institution, Archive saint henri uh, which is uh, turning 30 years uh, this year. So we uh, put uh, 30 um, in the logo. Uh, just one technical question. Do you see my mouse? We do, yeah. Yeah, that will be useful at the end of my talk. Uh, okay, so um, local symmetries have direct empirical status. Uh, this is usually contested, but uh, so probably you don't believe in this, but uh, by the end of my talk, I hope you will. Uh, so mm, theoretical symmetry is a symmetry in a physical theory. Uh, and uh, as we know, there are uh, many symmetries in uh, physical series, so uh, we would like to know what are they doing there, okay? Uh, and uh, one uh, explanation would be that uh, they are connected in the world, uh, to, with the world in some way. Uh, that's not the most obvious explanation because uh, precisely symmetries are usually linked with redundancy. Uh, but if we are interested in the ontology of symmetries, we should also consider that option. And if symmetries, uh, if we suppose that they are connected with the world indeed, then we should ask uh, uh, in which way are they connected. And the direct empirical status is uh, one such way. Uh, so this is a status that a theoretical symmetry has when it's matched with an empirical symmetry. So an empirical symmetry is a symmetry in the world which is exemplified by the four cases, which we'll see in a moment. And uh, so if your theoretical symmetry is connected with uh, something like these cases or with them, then it has this direct empirical status and presumably it uh, is not uh, redundant, is not superfluous, it is ontologically significant in this particular way. Uh, so if uh, you are interested in this kind of connection, uh, you should ask which Theoretical symmetries have it, presumably not all of them. <clears throat> and uh, uh, symmetries are, again, <laughs> if symmetries are associated with redundancy, then a natural conclusion would be that at least some symmetries are not uh, associated, uh, do not have direct empirical status. Uh, and uh, so, so you ask which of them do. And uh, first, uh, you can ask. Uh, um, Symmetries of what have direct empirical status, for instance, of equations or models. In the early literature, like Corso and Redding and Brown, uh, it was believed that symmetries of equations are concerned. Uh, afterwards, uh, symmetries of models, and uh, in my account as well, uh, symmetries of models, as we will see uh, briefly. But uh, the main question for today uh, would cons will concern uh, global versus local theoretical symmetries. Uh, or in other words, uh, expressed by parameters versus by functions or uh, also uh, uniform or non-uniform. Uh, so translations are global, expressed by parameters and uniform. Deformorphisms are uh, local, uh, expressed by functions and non-uniform. And likewise, in uh, the case of non-special temporal symmetries, uh, phase shifts or potential shifts are global and uh, gauge transformations are local. Uh, so uh, the main question uh, is of the debate about direct empirical status is whether only global or also local symmetries have direct empirical status. And uh, since the very first article which distinguished between direct and indirect empirical status, which was uh, by Corso, uh, the idea was that only global symmetries have direct empirical status. And uh, in the subsequent uh, articles by Bladen and Brown and Hillier, this was 
agreed with. Uh, but then came Graves and Wallace uh, and uh, uh, were claiming that also local symmetries are their chemical status and they uh, supported uh, them moderately. Uh, but uh, Friedrich uh, was criticizing this, and uh, Sebastian uh, present here, as well as uh, Nicholas Day, uh, it's, uh, himself was criticizing this, and uh, Gomez and so on. Uh, so the upshot is uh, that uh, basically just Gris and Wallace uh, are being, were arguing that local symmetries have their typical status, and all the others thought that only global symmetries have it. Uh, so you can think that nothing changed before and after Gris and Wallace. Uh, well, Actually, something did change. So after Gibbs and Wallace, uh, what changed was that uh, the way uh, the technical status was analyzed was based on Gibbs and Wallace's work, even uh, when uh, it was criticized. Uh, a precise example is uh, that uh, both um, Tay and Gomez uh, distinguish between relational and non-relational direct empirical significance. Well, this uh, distinction comes from Gibbs and Wallace's framework. So they are criticizing it, but they are using it at the same time. And uh, another supposition after Gibbs and Wallace was that if they are wrong, then also the conclusion is wrong. Okay, so if uh, something is bad about their framework, then local symmetries do not have direct empirical status. And uh, I uh, will be arguing that uh, this uh, should be, these presuppositions should be abandoned because uh, first, um, there is not only a Gibbs and Wallace like way of uh, analyzing uh, direct empirical state, there is also uh, my alternative framework, which is in a sense opposite to theirs. And uh, moreover, um, whatever, ha whatever happens with Gibbs and Wallace's framework, uh, if in my framework symmetries have the local uh, local symmetries have direct empirical status, then you can no longer say that just because their framework fails, uh, also local symmetries do not have direct empirical status because you also would need to repeat my framework. Okay, and uh, as Oliver said, uh, so I wrote the thesis on that, and beforehand I wrote uh, an article which has got a second place in a competition of uh, articles by a French Society for Philosophy of Science. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, you can learn more about that in these old works, but now I'm returning to this topic and hopefully there will be some new works maybe in some time. Uh, so uh, let's go briefly first to the case, uh, usual case studies and usual matchings, and then I will speak about uh, the two approaches uh, gives the policies in mind. So uh, here's the most <laughs> typical case study, Galileo ship. Um, so I, I, I go through several cases. I explain first how I represent any of them. Okay, so at the top you have uh, the ship, uh, which is not boosted with respect to the shore. <laughs> Here is the shore uh, <laughs> with a um, house on it. Okay, and at the bottom you have a ship which is boosted with respect to the shore, so you see a velocity, and uh, here is time. So at the, uh, some initial time, both ships uh, uh, say are at the same distance from the shore, but when time uh, changes, okay, when time goes, uh, one uh, ship which is not boosted stays uh, at the same distance, another changes. The distance, that's how you see it moves. Okay, so uh, just to repeat the presentation, at the top, uh, one, the initial state, at the bottom, uh, uh, a transformed state, okay, in the middle, you have, um, well, the reference in this case and the transformation and the time, okay. So uh, here's uh, now what this example consists in. Uh, so um, the ship, uh, is boosted with respect to the shore. However, however the phenomena inside uh, do not change if you observe them from inside. So here is a ball, uh, you uh, make it, you drop it from the top of the ship. <laughs> it's an example of what which kind of experiment would be invariant. So you drop it and when time goes, you um, discover that it fell, uh, it falls uh, at the center of the ship. Okay, and uh, if the ship uh, is boosted with respect to the shore, then uh, if you observe the same experiment from within uh, your boosted ship, you will again see that uh, the ball will fall at the same position with respect to that ship. Okay, while um, if, if you were observing from the outside, you, uh, you would see the difference. 
So that's an empirical symmetry uh, of ship. And it is, um, I remind that direct empirical status is a match in between uh, an empirical symmetry and the theoretical symmetry. So this one is matched with theoretical global boost symmetry. Uh, and I want to go briefly through these examples because they are not uh, the main thing in my talk, but uh, uh, just, uh, okay, I still would like to say a couple of words about each of them. So for the sketch empirical symmetry, you uh, make uh, some electromagnetic experiment within uh, the cage. Uh, you observe how it develops and then you uh, charge the cage so that you can see sparks uh, at the outer boundaries of the cage uh, with respect to some, if, if it's uh, close to some uh, uh, not charged, charged environment, uh, but as the experiment inside, it does not change. Uh, that's uh, for the sketch empirical symmetry. Uh, again, uh, just to remind the symmetry, you should have invariance. So invariance is of experiments within, and uh, you have a transformation, which is charging of the cage. Uh, and this is usually matched with, um, I, I put matchings with, uh, where, where I can. I also put matchings with local symmetry. These are uh, matchings of uh, Gibbs and Wallace. Uh, other matchings are more accepted as they are with global symmetries. So it can be matched with uh, global electrostatic potential symmetries or with local electromagnetic potential symmetries. So the, which, which means in theory, you transform here electrostatic or electromagnetic potential. Uh, then Einstein's elevator empirical symmetry. Uh, so you have an elevator in free uh, float and uh, the uh, light follows a, a straight trajectory. Uh, if you add a massive body, body uh, then uh, the uh, trajectory will uh, stay the same with respect to the person in the elevator. This is matched with global uh, gravitational potential symmetries. And uh, another version of the same, uh, so you, uh, this time uh, either you accelerate uh, the elevator to the top, and then you have a curved trajectory inside or uh, you put it at, at, the massive, at the surface of the massive body. Uh, so you have uh, like a vertical acceleration from that body uh, together with free fall, uh, okay, which compensate the charger and the trajectory is again uh, curved. Uh, this is matched with the same as the previous plus uh, upward acceleration. And finally, you have a 12 groups with empirical symmetry uh, and usually it's presented as in this slide, slide. Uh, so uh, here's a source, uh, two slits, and a final screen. Uh, the transformation is to add a half wave plate, which uh, phase shifts uh, the beam by 180 degrees in theory. <laughs> and uh, the result is uh, when you uh, when the, when you um, make uh, a beam of particles out of the source and uh, make it uh, go through the <laughs> device, uh, you get an interference pattern in this uh, case. And uh, with a phase shifter, you get a different interference pattern. That's how the case is usually presented. And it's matched with uh, global phase transformations or uh, local phase and the, and the local electromagnetic potential transformation. Uh, now, <laughs> I have objections to this case because, uh, mm, yeah, by several reasons. So one is uh, there is no non-trivial invariance in this case. Well, symmetry is supposed to manifest some invariance. What is the invariance in that case? Uh, well, the most salient, salient thing would be the interference pattern, but this precisely changes in this case. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure this is a genuine symmetry in this setup. Okay, another problem. Uh, well, if you like this kind of change of the first patterns, then uh, you should know that besides uh, besides uh, phase shifters, the same change can be generated by a solenoid. And this is just the Aaron of Bohm effect. So if you define your symmetries like symmetry like here, you uh, are basically conflating it with the Aaron of Bohm effect, which is made well, which possibly uh, serves to establish something else than some symmetrical symmetry. And uh, moreover, if uh, in the uh, Arnold Bohm's case, uh, the fact that you are using a solenoid uh, enab enables you to use electromagnetic potential transformation on the theoretical side because solenoid is uh, working with uh, electromagnetism. 
uh, well, it's an electromagnetic device, okay? Uh, but a phase shifter, it's not sure whether it's an electromagnetic device. And so in that case, uh, the use of uh, electromagnetic potential transformations and correspondingly of local phase transformations is not motivated. So what I propose instead is uh, to, uh, well, to seek setups, not with different interface pattern, but with environment interface pattern. And there are several ways to, to, to have this. So one is uh, you close one of the slits and then uh, you get, uh, but it will be not an interface pattern, but it will be something invariant, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's one possibility if you like the subsystems, because in this setup, usually the subsystem is taken to be uh, one of the, uh, this half beams. Uh, well, if you are not bothered with subsystems, but you like interference patterns, and here's another way you put uh, two um, identical phase shifters and uh, you get interference pattern uh, compared to the case where you put no, nothing <laughs> at all. Okay, uh, that's uh, more of a symmetry because uh, you do have a non trivial environment of interference patterns. Uh, another way. Uh, Again, the same patterns, but this time you put uh, one phase shifter and uh, a, a solenoid in this way or in that way. Uh, either way, okay, this or that, uh, either way, uh, the interface pattern is the same. This looks more like an empirical symmetry, but the matchings would be uh, unaffected and it, the, uh, the use of local electromagnetic potential transformations will be more motivated in this case. So this was a review of empirical symmetries and what they are usually matched with. And as you noticed, uh, usually they are matched with global symmetries. Some are also matched with local symmetries. Uh, now, this was just case studies. And now I want to go into uh, the different approaches to establishing direct empirical status. Uh, so uh, the um, if you want to make a good approach, a good way to start is to define uh, direct empirical status in some uh, useful uh, way. And uh, here is one counterexample about how you should not define direct empirical status if you want to uh, get something useful out of that. So uh, Day says uh, a symmetry acting on a subsystem has direct empirical status when the transformed and the untransformed subsystems are empirically indistinguishable from within the subsystem, but empirically distinguishable with respect to an environment. So basically, uh, you um, a subsystem symmetry has direct empirical status if uh, it is empirically indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the outside, from the inside of subsystem, but not from the outside. Okay. So what's bad in this definition? Uh, one uh, obvious thing is that it uh, does not say anything about theory and the world, about a matching between the two. It just says, okay, here is symmetry, here is empirical indistinguishability in some uh, place. So you can read the whole definition as applying only to uh, the level of the world or as applying only to the level of the theory, you do not see that there is a matching in between, okay? Uh, and that the, the two levels are in, involved. You could say, okay, uh, uh, symmetry in the world is, uh, has some curious property if it is empirically indistinguishable, okay? So this definition is not good because it does not tell you about the levels and the correspondence uh, between two different levels. So instead, I propose uh, something which I find to be better. I will explain why. Uh, so an explicit combination of the following. Uh, so, so what I'm doing is characterizing direct empirical status in some presumably better way, <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, direct empirical status involves a matching between empirical level and the theoretical level. This is what I said in the beginning, but it needs to be said if you want to, uh, okay, be, uh, well, to, to use this, the fact that there are two levels. Uh, moreover, matching can have a direction and matching can have a nature. Uh, okay, so what, uh, what, what does this, uh, what is the gain from uh, doing it that way? Well, because uh, this actually gives you different approaches to what is the typical status and to how establish it. And uh, here are uh, two approaches that I, uh, that I uh, distinguish based on this characterization. So one is a theoretical approach, uh, it's when you go from theoretical symmetries towards empirical symmetries. 
So you begin by theoretical symmetries, it's a theoretical approach. And I uh, take uh, Gibbs and Wallace to mostly, uh, well, to mostly uh, be uh, providing this approach. And uh, what I say in the, here in instantiation is a kind of characterize, uh, way of characterizing the nature of the matching. Okay, and the direction is characterized, as I said, uh, you go from theoretical to empirical. And the, finally, you have two levels. Uh, this is again from my definition. So the fact that I described direct empirical status by the conjunction of these three uh, criteria allowed me to distinguish this kind of approach. Okay, uh, so the approach is, uh, it's not only to how, about how you define the, the direct empirical status, it's also about how you establish it. So if your definition is the direct empirical status is something which uh, is, is a situation where Mm, theoretical symmetries are instantiated uh, by empirical symmetries, then your heuristics is going to be uh, start with some theoretical symmetries, uh, define what is the right way to instantiate them, and then find the empirical symmetries which satisfy that. Okay, so that's what uh, kind of explicitation of what the Gibbs and Wallace could be doing. But uh, of course, uh, that's, I'm, I'm not just uh, uh, want to interpret them, I want to propose my own approach. So here's another approach, which again uh, follows from this scheme, which in turn follows from my characterization of direct empirical status. So this approach is called empirical approach. Uh, and it, it proceeds as other way around. So the direction is converse. Uh, you start by empirical symmetries. Uh, you um, characterize uh, a relationship or which uh, they should have, which theoretical symmetries should have with these empirical symmetries. And then finally you seek theoretical symmetries which correspond to the relationships which you want to, to have, to obtain. And my uh, preferred relationship, my way to specify the nature of uh, the matching is uh, representation. So uh, what I, what my heuristics concern consist in in this approach, uh, empirical approach, is to start by empirical symmetries and seek for theoretical symmetries which represent empirical symmetries. Uh, so before I present my approach, I uh, will uh, say uh, something about Gibbs and Wallace's approach, <laughs> because uh, the context is, uh, as you remember, uh, there are two approaches which um, argue that local symmetries have direct empirical status. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start uh, briefly with Gibbs and Wallace's approach. Uh, so basically, uh, as far as if you are interested in uh, there, are many, uh, there are many things in their approach, but if we are interested in general rules about how to know whether a given theoretical symmetry has direct empirical status, then you get these three rules. And so first, if uh, theoretical, uh, and they, they um, basically work with two domains, uh, subsystem and environment, their conjunction amounts to the universe. Okay, so if uh, a theoretical symmetry on the subsystem combined with the theoretical identity on the environment, uh, yields a theoretical symmetry on the universe, then uh, this uh, the thing does not have direct empirical status. So what actually, uh, what does or does not have uh, status is actually uh, the subsystem symmetry. Okay, but uh, to, to know whether it does have direct empirical status or not, you should uh, get to a universal symmetry or, or transformation. That's why uh, this, uh, more complicated construction. Okay, so here's a case without the typical status. Now, two other cases if theoretical symmetry on the subsystem combined with theoretical identity on the environment uh, does not yield the theoretical symmetry on the universe, then uh, this subsystem symmetry has uh, the typical status from uh, the matching with relational empirical symmetry. And finally, if theoretical symmetry on the subsystem, when combined with some adjustment on the environment. The adjustment is motivated by the fact that the original environment state cannot be uh, <laughs> combined with the transformed subsystem state. Okay, so if uh, so it's subsystem symmetry combined with some adjustment on the environment does not yield a symmetry on the universe, then this uh, theoretical subsystem symmetry has a empirical status, but this time uh, with respect to non-relational empirical symmetries. Okay, uh, so um, this is the approach, but why uh, why should we be unhappy? <laughs> okay, with uh, this, uh, 
so uh, several objections. Uh, for instance, uh, Lady Man says, um, this case, uh, the first one, which uh, uh, according to this involves does not lead to any direct empirical status, can actually be matched with uh, phenomena where uh, the process is observable, but uh, the result is indistinguishable from uh, the original state. That's a thesis. I will not go into details, but the, the claim is uh, there is a phenomenon corresponding to um, this first kind of statistical symmetries, and it can be counted as an empirical symmetry. Another objection, uh, again, Lazyman says, uh, Galileo's ship is relational because uh, with respect to the shore, because uh, when you boost the ship, the relationship with the shore changes. But uh, it also he, uh, is, uh, uh, the boosted ship is, move, is moving, and so the, it uh, gets hits, uh, heated by the water. Okay, and the water uh, is likewise affected by the ship if it is boosted. Uh, okay, uh, so what I uh, um, uh, what is my conclusion from this kind of uh, observation is that Galileo's ship empirical symmetry can also be understood as non-relational with respect to the water. And so this involves this uh, idea was that some symmetries are relational, others are non-relational uh, when we speak about empirical symmetries. And now I'm saying, uh, well, given what Ladyman said, okay, uh, the same symmetry can be relational and non-relational. And that uh, somehow breaks <laughs> the logic of the framework. Uh, another objection, uh, you start with uh, what is theoretical symmetry on the subsystem. And this is op opposed to uh, identity on something. So symmetry is supposed to be not identity, but some non-trivial transformation. That's on the, this is on the theoretical level. But this kind of symmetry is matched on the level of uh, the world is matched with an empirical symmetry, which is supposed to be identity on the subsystem. Okay, so on the theoretical level, you have uh, a non-trivial transformation of the subsystem. On the uh, empirical level, you have uh, identity on the subsystem. Something does not work there because there is a mismatch, okay? Why uh, do you want to uh, match a non-trivial transformation with, with uh, identity? Uh, one more objection. Um, they are saying, again, uh, this concerns the matching with relational empirical symmetries. They are saying that relational empirical symmetries are those where uh, there is identity on the subsystem and identity on the environment. So what changes in these cases, like a leadership, is uh, they are saying just the relationship between the subsystem and the environment. But the thing is, in their framework, there is no provision to, uh, for a represent, uh, well, for for relationship itself. There is just a state of the subsystem, state of the uh, environment, state of the universe, but there is no provision for the relationship. So, uh, uh, well, if you have a matching uh, and you have a changed relationship on the empirical side, uh, it is strange that you match, match it with something which is uh, not there on the theoretical side, okay? So on the empirical, you have relationship. Uh, which is uh, the basis of your symmetry, of the change uh, involved in your symmetry. On the theoretical side, you do not have a relationship. Again, it is strange that you make a machine where there is a disanalogy in between empirical and theoretical level. Uh, another objection, uh, well, uh, in this uh, final matching, uh, they say that, um, uh, that it is a concern though, concerns those uh, transformations on the subsystem which uh, mm, cannot be matched, well, which, which cannot be combined with the original environment state. So the idea is you have some subsystem state, you have some environment state. Then you make transformation on the subsystem, and it turns out that the old <laughs> environment state is no longer compatible with the new uh, subsystem state. And that's why you need to make an, theoretically an adjustment to the environment state. Okay. So uh, the problem is that uh, first, it's supposed to be some not very significant adjustment, as I understand. Second, uh, whatever, whatever it is, it is induced by this uh, theoretical incompatibility. 
Now on the empirical side, uh, you have, uh, you're supposed to also have some change in the environment, but the nature of this change is not specified. How it, uh, um, and it, it is not induced, again, there is a, this analogy because it cannot be induced by, uh, by the transformation of the subsystem because again, on the physical, on the uh, level of the world, you suppose that there is identity on the subsystem and not a transformation like on, there was on the theoretical uh, level. Okay, so the problem in this case is that, again, you have a disanalogy because on the theoretical side, you have an adjustment due to a transformation on the subsystem. On the empirical side, you have some uh, unspecified change, uh, which cannot be due to the transformation of the subsystem because on the empirical side, there is no transformation of the subsystem. And uh, moreover, this change is supposed to be intrinsic, which is strange because if something is induced by a change uh, on the theoretical level or by a change uh, on the subsystem, then the change, the induced change should be relational because it is, uh, okay, it is uh, induced by something else. It cannot be intrinsic. Uh, okay, final objection, but you can devise more <laughs> or find in the literature, but just uh, it was just to give some idea of uh, why you would not be satisfied with this framework. Okay, so final objection, uh, if, if we suppose that in this case uh, there is no change, uh, in the relational case, there is no change. Uh, we are sure about that. That's how they define the relational symmetry. There is no intrinsic change to the environment and the subsystem. Okay. In the non-relational case, there is some unspecified change, which is supposed to be intrinsic. But uh, as I said, <laughs> it is a strange supposition. So what we have in all the three cases, there is uh, either no change or uh, some um, probably not significant change. Okay, on the empirical side. Uh, well, then we can ask, okay, what if there is a considerable change on the empirical side? And we can also ask, what is it if there is a considerable change on the theoretical side? These questions are not answered by the, this kind of uh, three matchings, which we have seen, okay? Because it mostly concentrates on transformation of the subsystem. It's not uh, so concerned about transformation of the environment, uh, including considerable transformation. So at, 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 uh, at best, the framework is incomplete in this respect. So uh, yeah, and the final thing to say about this is uh, just if you concentrate on this original metrics, you see why I said that this is a theoretical approach. Well, because in any case, you start with something theoretical and then you get, uh, well, then you get to something empirical. So that's precisely as I characterized it, a theoretical approach. Start with theoretical symmetry, seek for empirical symmetry, which suits. Uh, yeah, this, this distinction between approaches was not done before <laughs> my framework, so I'm illustrating why it's useful and why it does apply to Gibbs and Wallace's account. Uh, so, so we saw uh, the usual matchings of empirical symmetries with theoretical symmetries. We saw how Gibbs and Wallace account tried to account for this and why this does not uh, well, uh, why is there reasons to think it does not uh, work, it does not completely work, okay? So uh, what else can we say about why, uh, why we should seek for another approach besides uh, Gibson Wallace's or uh, in addition to it? Mm. Well, uh, even uh, I, I give some objections from, from myself, okay, there are more um, by other persons. Uh, so Gibson Wallace's uh, uh, framework was uh, criticized a lot. Uh, for uh, my framework is new, and uh, there has not been, uh, uh, well, I have not heard about, <laughs> there have been great problems about it uh, at least yet. Okay, so this is presumably, my framework is presumably uh, less problematic. Okay, uh, another uh, important concern uh, is um, the framework by Greaves and Wallace is very restricted. It does not account even for Schrodinger a picture of quantum mechanics as they recognize themselves and does not account for non-local uh, versions of uh, gauge theory. Uh, and uh, there is no such restriction in my approach and arguably it is uh, uh, worrying if uh, some framework will not account even for <laughs> Schrodinger quantum mechanics, okay? Uh, so well, as I say, okay, we can account for Heisenberg picture. <laughs> so uh, it's not uh, so terrible, but uh, we can seek for uh, a more comprehensive framework like mine. 
Okay. Uh, then even if you believe in beliefs and Wallace's conclusions, uh, which is uh, not uh, a very frequent case because, as I said, they think that local symmetries have direct empirical status, but many people think that global only global symmetries do. Okay, but even if you are convinced by this and Wallace's framework, it would be interesting to know whether their conclusions uh, uh, can be confirmed by uh, within some other framework. And finally, uh, here is an interesting feature of my approach. In it, we are guaranteed to have direct empirical status. Uh, here you can see uh, like the opposite of this. So the opposite, if you start with theoretical symmetries, surely you are not guaranteed to have a direct empirical status. Why? Because you are not guaranteed to have a corresponding empirical symmetries. This is just an instance of the usual problem about the ontology of symmetries. Uh, of theoretical symmetries, okay? <laughs> when you have some theoretical symmetry, you do not know whether it corresponds to mm, something in the world. Uh, okay, this is a basic problem about the ontology of symmetry. But in my framework, you uh, do uh, know because uh, you start with empirical symmetry. Then as we will see, you will get by to theoretical symmetries anyway. And that's how <laughs> in my framework, uh, you, as you will see, uh, we are guaranteed to have direct empirical status. So why should this be an, a good feature? Well, because if your approach is about direct empirical status, presumably you should be interested in, uh, uh, well, uh, as the first instance, in those cases where uh, direct empirical status does obtain. So my approach allows to single out these cases. The theoretical approach does not. It can, uh, it's like, uh, uh, it allows you to go towards the empirical level, but it does not allow you to always end up having direct empirical status. Okay, so uh, let's uh, now see uh, my approach. And in it, uh, as promised, uh, so <laughs> there are always three components. So I start with empirical symmetries, then with representation relationship, and finally uh, with uh, matching theoretical symmetries. So, um, what is empirical symmetry on my approach? Uh, well, it's easy. Uh, so here's again Galileo's ship. Um, this is a, a ship which is uh, uh, stationary with respect to the reference. I call this a, an extended state. So this is a, a how uh, your ship evolves uh, with all experiments within, okay, before you boosted it. And here is another extended state. It's extended in time. Okay, uh, here's how your ship evolves after it's boosted together with all experiments within. So empirical symmetry is just a, uh, basically it's consistent. It's composed by these two states, initial and final. And uh, it's uh, what's important is that they are. Um, that they uh, manifest some observable difference, which in this case is a difference with respect to uh, the shore. Okay, uh, what's interesting is that they, uh, it's, uh, the states should manifest the difference, but it's not required that they are always linked by a, a, an actual transformation. Why? Uh, well, this comes uh, from um, Braden and Brown's article because they say there are two uh, equivalent ways to uh, um, uh, realize empirical symmetries. One is uh, take uh, one ship, observe it, and then transform it. Another way is take two ships, which, of which one is already different with respect to another. In this second case, of course, you do not have an actual transformation. The ship is just different. It's another ship, okay? Uh, but you do still have observable difference. That's how it happens that transformation is dispensable. Uh, well, actual transformation is dispensable, but observable difference is not. Uh, yeah, and the extended states, uh, some, some call this history, okay, uh, an extended state. Uh, and so that was about the first element, what is an empirical symmetry in my approach. Uh, there, there are further uh, additions uh, here in the bottom, but I will not go into details. Uh, now, second element, uh, what is adequate representation in my approach? Well, schematically, it's just uh, here on the left, you have empirical symmetry. On the right, you have something theoretical which adequately represents it. So the basic idea of this image is that uh, adequate representation of empirical symmetry should uh, have all the uh, essential components represented. 
Okay, so you distinguish what are essential components in the mechanical symmetry. All of them should have some kind of counterpart in your theoretical, theoretical thing. And then uh, you can say this thing adequately represents my empirical theory. But notice that I do not say that something theoretical which adequately represents an empirical symmetry is itself a uh, symmetry. Why? Well, because I do not need to uh, say this because it just falls automatically from my approach. Uh, now we will see how. So here again, the three elements. Uh, so recall that I define, uh, in, uh, so the, the point is to arrive to this third element because we are interested uh, to remind the question was where the global, the original question uh, in the second slide, uh, where the global, uh, also, only global also local symmetries have direct empirical status and more generally, where the, which symmetries have empirical status, okay? So what we want to arrive by the end is some specification of what is a theoretical symmetry which has direct empirical status in my approach, okay? So we start, as I said, with uh, empirical symmetry. And um, to, you, as you recall, I have just defined it as two partially identical uh, extended empirical states, which can possibly be linked by uh, an empirical transformation. But uh, in fact, the most important thing is just that they be partially identical, partially different. OK. Uh, well, from this, you can deduce, uh, you just uh, omit empirical <laughs> from this definition, and you deduce that asymmetry in general is just to partially identical states, possibly linked by a transformation. And from this, you deduce theoretical symmetry definition by just uh, putting, uh, okay, theoretical uh, into this general definition. Uh, so again, theoretical symmetry on my approach is to partially identical theoretical states, possibly linked by a theoretical transformation. Uh, this is a non-standard definition because usually symmetry and theoretical symmetry is defined as transformation, which preserves something, okay? So first, the transformation is not dispensable. Uh, states uh, may be identical, not partially identical. In my case, the definition is what I have just given. And uh, why? Well, because it's motivated by my vehicle approach. And that's not bad, as <laughs> we will see. Uh, Okay, so second adequate representation, I'm just spelling out what are the, uh, the components of your empirical symmetry, which are essential. And as promised, uh, adequate representation is the fact of having counterparts of these components. Uh, so one um, requirement is the um, adequate representation should share a minimal structural similarity, which means it should have two states, possibly leading by a transformation, very simple criteria. Okay, and another concerns is this partial observ partial um, difference and partial uh, identity with respect to all observable features. Okay, for these two, your um, adequate representation should have a, uh, some kind of counterpart. Okay, so which means uh, your adequate representation should not only have two states in by transformation, but also should have such states that they are partially identical in their observational consequences and partially different. From this, it actually follows that uh, theoretical symmetry with direct empirical status in my approach is an observationally incomplete uh, theoretical, well, sorry, is that uh, a sink. A theoretical sink which adequately represents an empirical symmetry in my approach is a theoretical symmetry uh, which is observationally incomplete. Uh, so again, the move here, you start by just something theoretical which represents an empirical symmetry, and you infer that this is an empirical, this is a theoretical symmetry and not just some theoretical sink. How do you infer this? Well, you just uh, uh, notice that the conjunction of this uh, well, that this conjunction uh, and the fact that you are in a theoretical approach amounts to exactly the satisfaction of this definition. That's how automatically in my approach, uh, thing which represents an empirical symmetry adequately is an, an, an theoretical symmetry. And that's how automatically you get direct empirical status in my approach. Okay, uh, as uh, soon as you have these conditions to satisfy. And, uh, to uh, repeat, uh, the fact that in uh, my approach, both uh, observational, uh, observably identical elements of your empirical symmetry and observably different elements of your empirical symmetry should be represented, uh, this means that the results in theoretical symmetry will be observationally incomplete, which means some of its predictions will be the same, 
for uh, the ship before and after the transformation, some will be different. Namely, uh, the symmetry will predict, uh, the theoretical symmetry with direct empirical status will predict that um, phenomena within uh, the ship in both states uh, are, will be the same, and it will predict that um, with respect to the shore, the ship will be behave differently when it is boosted compared to when it's not. This is what is called observationally incomplete uh, theoretical symmetry. It's a symmetry which has partially different predictions. Okay, and uh, this uh, my approach has a number of interesting features, but uh, I will not go through all the details of this. I will tell just uh, two things. Uh, in my approach. Um, it follows that theoretical symmetries with direct empirical status are symmetries of models uh, understood as extended states, but not necessarily of equations. How do you know this? Well, in my approach, there is no restriction as to which state is, should be represented using which equations, which means that you can represent uh, the stationary sta sta uh, state of the ship by one theory using equations of one theory, and uh, the boosted state of the ship by using equations of another theory. That's how, in my approach, you are not guaranteed that uh, the fact of passing from the, st the stationary state to the boosted state uh, is a symmetry of equations. Okay, it's not guaranteed because you can use different equations for different states. And the second thing I wanted to say, as just explained, um, symmetries uh, which have direct empirical status uh, should be observationally incomplete. They should predict that the boosted ship is observably different from the uh, non-boosted ship. Okay, so observably incomplete symmetries have direct empirical status, which means observably complete symmetries do not have direct empirical status in my approach. Uh, example of uh, observ observationally complete symmetries are diffeomorphisms, for instance, they are presumed to be such as not to predict any difference. Uh, okay, uh, so these kinds of symmetries do not have the typical status in my approach. And they are local, by the way. Uh, and so uh, Gibson Wallace and uh, even more they uh, propose, uh, okay, let's forget all the symmetries which do not have the typical status when we are discussing the typical status. Let's question out these other symmetries. I say no. Why? We will see in a moment. Uh, so finally, I was promising to tell that in my approach, local uh, symmetries have direct empirical status. So here is a, a proof. Uh, okay, as much as <laughs> perhaps not complete proof, but uh, I, I will tell the basic idea. So here is this uh, scheme. The uh, left part, uh, the black one, is a global symmetry with direct empirical status. Because as you remember, uh, almost, well, no, usually nobody de denies that global symmetries have direct empirical status. What is denied is that local symmetries have direct empirical status. So assume that there is a global symmetry which has direct empirical status. This is uncontroversial. Uh, so a zero is, uh, can be a non-boosted ship, S1 is a boosted ship, a T is a, a transformation of uh, uh, adding uniform velocity on the ship. Okay. Uh, now, uh, T1 and T0 are uh, transformations which uh, are observ observationally complete. So they do not change predictions and they do not have direct empirical status in my framework. And so the idea is that uh, using these transformations, you can build uh, all that is in green in, his, in this uh, scheme, and all that is in green is local. And so the idea is you start by a global symmetry which has direct empirical status, you use these symmetries which do not have direct empirical status, and you end up having symmetries which also do have direct empirical status, like the original symmetry, but the difference is that the new symmetries are local. So from a global symmetry, you get a local symmetry. From a symmetry which has direct empirical status, you get some more symmetries which also have direct empirical status. And for this, you use precisely these transformations which uh, Gibbs and Wallace and they wanted to question out and forget. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's why I said you should not forget them even when they do not have direct empirical status. So here is just a, an overview of how to 
um, demonstrate. So we need to demonstrate two things. So the second will be that the green things are local. And the first thing will be uh, that they are observ observationally equivalent. Because remember, in my approach, what allows uh, global symmetry to have direct empirical status is the fact that it adequately represents some empirical symmetry. So basically, uh, the, what guarantees that your theoretical, your theoretical symmetry has empirical status, direct empirical status, is uh, the predictions of that empirical symmetry, of that, that theoretical symmetry. So as long as you preserve the predictions, your results in symmetry is still guaranteed to have the same empirical status with respect to the same empirical symmetry. Because if empirical status is a function of predictions, okay, <laughs> as I repeat, as long as you preserve the predictions, you preserve empirical status. That's the idea. So how do I uh, demonstrate that this new empirical symmetries so these new theoretical symmetries have the same uh, predictions uh, than uh, the original global symmetry. Well, by assumption, these uh, auxiliary transformations are observationally complete, which means they are assumed to preserve all predictions which were there, which were associated to the state on which they act. So logically, if you apply such a transformation, which, preserves, which is assumed to preserve prediction, you apply it to some state, you are guaranteed to get a state which has all the same predictions as the previous state. Now, if you have a transformation which links uh, uh, well, two states, and if each of these states is, is transformed into a state which is equivalent with respect to predictions, then the transformation which links new states Will be, uh, will be observationally uh, with respect to predictions just like the original transformations. Transformation. Because predictions are preserved on uh, each of the states. Uh, and how do you demonstrate uh, that some transformation is local? Well, uh, take, for instance, this diagonal transformation. In my approach, local means uh, effectively non uniform, global means effectively uniform. Uh, now, you see that this transformation, for instance, uh, T double prime, is the same as the combination of global transformation plus uh, T1. Because either way, you get from uh, the state uh, uh, S0 to S1 prime. Okay, so, so this one is equivalent to the combination of these two. Now, you notice that the first in this combination is global, which means effectively uniform. And the second is local, which means effectively non-uniform. Again, it's presumed to be local. I'm, I'm putting assumptions on these auxiliary transformations to get what I want on the uh, green ones, okay? So you notice one transformation is uh, uniform, another is not uniform. And they are supposed to be equivalent, the combination is supposed to be equivalent to a third transformation. Well, then your transformations can be nothing else than non-uniform. Because just think again, uniform plus non-uniform cannot be equivalent to a uniform transformation. Because there is this non-uniform part which can be should be compensated so that you get to the same state. Okay. That's how you can uh, basically demonstrate that all these uh, green elements are local in the sense of non-uniform. And uh, finally, as soon as you demonstrate, uh, that you preserved observational consequences by but passed from global to local, you have demonstrated that local symmetries have direct empirical status with respect to the same empirical symmetry with respect to which your original transformation had it. And that's how you get actually four empirical sim four theoretical symmetries uh, from this uh, scheme, which all have direct empirical status with respect to the same empirical symmetry. So this is uh, it is the original. Uh, symmetry, this symmetry, this symmetry, and uh, the final symmetry here. And they all have direct empirical status just by virtue of uh, conditions which you put on this other <laughs> symmetries, which uh, is and Wallace and they were proposing to question out. Uh, so uh, we are moving to <laughs> like uh, the very uh, a few last slides. Okay, so what is the upshot of this discussion? Uh, well, I started by presenting some matchings, and then I presented this and Wallace's approach. I said it's not 
um, satisfactory in some ways, and we would like to have some alternative approach, even in case we like Gales and Wallace's approach, and even more in case we don't like. Uh, okay, so when I was going through the matching in the beginning, uh, I was saying that some symmetries are matched with global, some empirical symmetries are matched with global sym theoretical symmetries, other empirical symmetries are matched with both global and local sym theoretical symmetries. So uh, in Gales and Wallace's case, it looked like uh, sometimes you only have global symmetries which have direct empirical status. And in other cases, you have both global and local symmetries which have direct empirical status with respect to the same empirical symmetry. So it looked like there is some kind of variation depending on the case study. Well, what my proof shows is that uh, there is no such variation. The variation is just an artifact of uh, selection of uh, Gris and Wallace's theoretical symmetries. If they want it, if my proof is right, if my approach is adopted, then in general, you should always have both global and local symmetries, which have mm, direct empirical status with respect to the same empirical symmetry. If you proceed in the direction of first global and local, it's just what was demonstrated by the proof. Okay, each time you have a global symmetry, you can have some local symmetries, which also have direct empirical status with respect to the same empirical symmetry. So now we know that it is uh, that uh, this uh, it is uh, this underdetermination, if you want, obtains systematically, at least in my approach. Each time, uh, okay, you have direct empirical status. It is both for global and for local symmetries, which means that it suggests that you have a kind of uh, uh, deflationary, okay, situation because. Uh, we started by saying that direct empirical status is something which allows you to single out those theoretical symmetries which are of ontologically significant. And now you get that, okay, it does not single out because I, all the time you have both global and local symmetries with the status. So what to do with this? Uh, and here's a Ledemann's distinction, which is, uh, I think, greatly nuances the debate. It's a distinction between kinds of direct empirical status, in particular, uh, what I call weaker and stronger direct empirical status. Stronger is uh, one which is uh, more difficult to satisfy. And so a way out for those who like <laughs> global symmetries more than local would be to say, okay, what the proof demonstrates is just that both global and local symmetries have some weaker direct empirical status, but we can still that would be an idea of defenders of global symmetries. We can still argue that maybe of all these symmetries, only global ones have a stronger kind of direct empirical status. And uh, why I think, uh, and uh, that uh, gives a new uh, direction to the whole debate, because now the question is not where the both global and local symmetries have direct empirical status, but which uh, status each of them has. And does, is it the case that local symmetries have only a weaker status and not the stronger one? So why I think it is not the case? Well, because uh, the fact that I, in my proof, uh, we get from global, we start by global, we get to local. Uh, you can say, okay, uh, this kind of suggests that local are secondary because we begin by global ones. Okay, but actually this can be an artifact of the proof. I just started this in this way, but the fact that I arrived to the local symmetries uh, in the second time does not by itself uh, say, uh, show you that they have a weaker empirical status, perhaps they have just the same or a stronger one. And uh, moreover, uh, Tay says that uh, in my proof, uh, it was from global to local, but he says, okay, consider the converse direction from local to global. And he is arguing that in that case, it's not always the case that you have global counterparts with direct empirical status if you have st started with local uh, ones. And uh, in that case, this would be, uh, I would say, this is a case in favor of uh, local symmetries, okay? Because in that case, you would have only local symmetries, whatever the status they have, global symmetries will not have it, <laughs> okay? So this will be, uh, uh, even better for the defenders of uh, uh, local symmetries. And uh, so our original question was uh, whether not only global, but also local symmetries have direct empirical status. By now we arrive to the converse question, because if they is right, then the question will be, 
uh, whether uh, not only local but also global symmetries have some empirical status, and the reply can be possibly that no, only local symmetries have some status, not global ones. And uh, yeah, I promised to, to demonstrate a couple of things, so I think I demonstrated them. One was uh, that uh, the symmetries uh, uh, which uh, do not affect predictions should not be quotient out. I explained that they are useful for the proof. And the uh, second was that uh, uh, related to this Gibbs and Wallace uh, uh, framework, um, so the presuppositions were that uh, there's just one <laughs> A framework for analyzing uh, uh, critical status, which is Gibson Wallace's one. I showed there is another framework, uh, which is a representational approach to the critical status. And uh, I also showed that if Gibson and Wallace are, are wrong, it does not automatically follow that uh, local symmetries do not have the critical status, because in my framework, they still do have the critical status. And uh, this holds whatever happens with Gibson and Wallace's approach. And as I mentioned, I hope to have new works on this topic summarizing this kind of uh, uh, material. So just the very last slide. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I have been editing this special issue on the, on the direct empirical status. And uh, for direct empirical status part, I was helped with Wayne Miller, so thanks to him for this. And uh, to this part is accepted uh, a two-part paper uh, by David Wallace, uh, which uh, is called the isolated subsystems and the asymmetries. And you can, it was uh, in studies for history and philosophy of modern physics. Now it's in studies for history and philosophy of science. So you can find that article there or maybe something else. Uh, and uh, um, hopefully in the future, I will be able to make the indirect empirical status part. And uh, it's not fixed where. Uh, but uh, hopefully perhaps one option could be in the same journal as the first part. And uh, in, in indirect empirical status also distinguished by cost. So is when theoretical symmetries are linked with conservation laws or uh, in my more generalized understanding, uh, when theoretical symmetries are linked with uh, phenomena uh, via some mediating theoretical elements. So this is for me a kind of topic which uh, involves interlevel relationships between symmetries and other theoretical elements and then phenomena. Okay, so if I get to this part, uh, hopefully in some time, uh, I uh, uh, would uh, need uh, some contributors and uh, perhaps uh, those who are involved in uh, this volume by Reid Pacente on Nerd Series could uh, be interested in participating. So if you uh, think there is any such person or you are yourself such a person, just write me about that. Uh, and that's all, thank you very much. Thank you.